Good morning, everyone, and behalf on the Rohini Nilekani Philanthropies, welcome to the penultimate session in the Resilient Societies track. In this session, which we have called Uncommon Ground, we aim to engage in dialogue and work towards a common ground about the roles of the society and the state. The issues to be explored include how can the state and the society coexist? What drives an imbalance of power from time to time? Why is it that at times there is a tension between Samaj and Sarkar? And are there ways to think of the two as complementary in the context of citizen welfare? Before we begin, a few housekeeping, housekeeping rules for the audience. There are two windows or tabs to your right, the chat window for conversation on topics being discussed. We encourage you to let us know your th thoughts to throughout the session. And a Q&A window explicitly for questions you may have. Ask your questions throughout the session as well. And the most upvoted ones will be picked up and driven towards the speakers throughout the session. We hope to run the session for about 50 minutes. With that, let me now hand over to our moderator for the session, Gopal Sankar Narayanan, a senior advocate of the Supreme Court of India, the youngest to have been so recognized in the last 25 years. Gopal, thank you for being here and over to you to introduce our speakers and drive the session forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yash. Um, I always find myself a little uh, at lack of ease when I'm uh, faced with the prospect of having giants in our field like Yamini and Jasmine here. Um, I've always read with great interest about <clears throat> the various opinions that Yamini has put across and the work that she's done at the Center for Policy Res Research, which uh, she is now um, uh, commandeering from the front and the kind of changes that she has brought within the organization as well. Um, and with Jasmine, who is an old friend now for a while, and the work that he does with the Delhi Dialogue and Development uh, Commission. Uh, I think uh, I th it's, it's fantastic that people like Jasmine are on the other side. Uh, we, we look at him as one of us, members of civil society, and the work that he has been doing has been exemplary. I know there must be great difficulties and challenges that uh, he has been facing uh, while on the other side and the criticism that he Basis, and we'll explore all of that in the coming minutes. I don't know if I need a, a broader uh, credentials and details regarding the two of them. Uh, most people know them. Uh, Yamini Ayer has a historic association with civil society and her work at uh, the Center for Policy Research, where she's the president and chief executive, stands out. Um, Jasmine Shah has uh, previously worked with uh, JPAL uh, in the US and comes from Columbia University. Here he is the uh, head of the vice chairperson of the Delhi Dialogue and Development uh, Commission. Uh, welcome, Yamini and Jasmine, to uh, this session, which is called "Coexistence Between Strong Society and Strong State." As a moderator, and this is uncommon for me, uh, I was commenting to the person who invited me, saying, "You don't want someone like me. I'm a lawyer. I go to courts. I get into arguments." Um, and usually it's very difficult for me to moderate discussions, but it's something that I'm going to slowly find my way somehow today with the help of the two of you. And I'll keep my comments to a, a, a minimum. Uh, if I can just start by inviting the two of you, Jasmine first, if that's okay, uh, to give us some introductory remarks about the topic. I had a conversation earlier with Jasmine and I found that he had something to say about the way the uh, topic itself was framed which is the coexistence between strong society and strong state. I think we are in the throes of a very vital discussion about the role that uh, government, but particularly in India, is playing in many parts across the world where we have what uh, they call themselves strong governments in Turkey and in Brazil, etc. Uh, I'd like to hear your views, uh, Jasmine, if you could just start and just tell us what you think. Thank you, Gopal, and uh, first of all, my wishes for a very happy Independence Day to all of you. Um, it's a very serious topic, and uh, you know, when I was just reading about the title of the topic, the first sort of thought in my mind, because we're talking about a balance between a strong state and a strong society, arguably civil society and markets. Um, the apprehension I had when I first thought about it, is this idea of a strong state. And I think different people might interpret it differently. Um, we do want 
and efficient. So when we talk about state, if we are actually talking about government, then what I would argue is that you don't want a strong government because we are seeing examples of that all over the world as well as in India as to when a government tries to overreach and um, therefore impinge upon the rights of the other actors of the society, uh, what kind of outcomes we get. So we want an efficient government. We want a government that um, acts as a facilitator. It, it recognizes the legitimate roles of the other key stakeholders in the society, um, civil society or the private sector, and uh, is not, uh, you know, hell bent to sort of dictate terms to the other actors uh, and gives them a legitimate space. Of course, state also means the judiciary and other organs of the state. And, and there, arguably, you do want a strong and an independent uh, judiciary. But as, as much as it relates to the role of the government, um, I would say the idea of a strong government is somewhat worrisome. Um, you know, I mean, of course, I mean, I, I think at the outset, this, this idea that, yes, a resilient society needs a very strong balance and uh, a feeling, a sense of mutual respect between the state and the, you know, the Samaj, the Sarkar and the Bazaar. I, I completely subscribe to it. Uh, and the converse is also true, which is, um, you know, a state that is trying too hard to control or dictate terms to the civil society or the markets. Um, or, you know, it could also be where, you know, private sector or private players are able to effectively dictate terms to the state about what policies should be implemented or a civil society which tries as hard as it could, but is not able to influence, um, you know, the, the policies or, or uh, you know, how the state acts. And these are all markers, I would say, of a weak democracy. Now, obviously, I think at a, when we talk about India's experience, we've had uh, a range. I don't think we, we exist in either of these uh, extremes at all points in time. But I would argue that in the current context, um, we see far too many examples of the latter, where there is a, a, a weakening of this equilibrium or a desired balance between the role of the state and, and the society. And, um, you know, just a couple of examples that come first to my head is this ongoing farmers agitation. Uh, just the way the bills were brought about in the parliament, um, you know, in the middle of a pandemic through an ordinance where you didn't even have a discussion, but passed, you know, in, in Haribari. And after months and months of agitations where so many hundreds of farmers have lost their lives, the state still doesn't seem to be in a uh, discussion mode. Uh, we just had a day or two ago, an example of a union minister calling out the private sector and calling it anti-national. So I think these are all, uh, uh, you know, as much as the state would like to profess that it respects uh, the boundaries of what the state ought to do, these are examples that show you uh, that we are far away from where we ought to be. Um, I would uh, say, therefore, I mean, uh, that, you know, yes, while, while center, uh, this, is, this is how things are at the center, uh, somewhat the onus of what, therefore, this equilibrium between the Samaj and the Sarkar should look like should therefore fall also on, uh, you know, state governments and opposition parties, because that's the beauty of the federal structure, that when you have something, uh, 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 an undesirable sort of an example, then there are opportunities that others have to show, okay, what, what, how, how would you want to reimagine this kind of a balance? Are there other models possible within our constitutional framework? And I think this is the uh, sort of uh, an opportunity that uh, state governments have. Uh, I'm going to... Uh, uh, speak maybe for another two minutes, Gopal, about the experience um, in Delhi, because I think that uh, I would say uh, throws up a counter as to uh, some of the things that uh, I feel would sort of, uh, in, in a way, this balance has been uh, thought about in Delhi. So now Delhi, of course, is a very interesting and a unique example because the party in power itself has emerged from a civil society movement. So the people today... Um, the ministers and the elected government are people who have spent long time agitating and being part of the civil society. Uh, and therefore, this idea of negotiating with the civil society, talking to the civil society is not alien, right? Um, there are a couple of examples that I can, you know, and over the discussion, we can talk more about the experiences in Delhi. But I would say the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic shows up as uh, uh, 
you know multiple instances where the government could not have done it alone and it is because right from day one that we had this attitude of collaboration and working together with actors uh, outside the government uh, of course there are layers of government within delhi that was essential to coordinate with but the civil society and the private sector they all really came together to respond to the pandemic and and if you're talking about resilient societies i think covid-19 throws up uh, just the perfect backdrop for how resilient societies can respond to crises like this so uh, you know delhi at its peak was uh, providing 2 million cooked 2 million cooked meals per day at the time of the first lockdown uh, so 20 lakh cooked meals and and that was all the you know rwas ngos all of them combined but coordinated by dms and the state disaster Man- uh, management agency even with the private sector you know delhi i remember the first time delhi uh, launched an app showing the real time availability of covid-19 beds in private as well as government hospitals there was a lot of resistance from private hospitals as to how can we update this this is not practical but it was series of discussions after which these hospitals was brought on board and and this was all it, this was all led by the health minister of delhi and i think that sense of trust happens when you take the effort to in, indulge in a dialogue and actually hear out the concerns of the other side which i would say was done and during the second wave a lot of i would say resource mobilization oxygen cylinder oxygen plant this is when the entire society chipped in and uh, ddc especially my commission was at the forefront of coordinating a lot of these efforts uh, so that is one the second example that comes to my mind is uh, you know how do you systematically create role for civil society in governance i think this was one of the themes of uh, the discussion as well and in delhi i would say the school management committees and the work that has happened in the education uh, you know reforms uh, throws up an uh, excellent case study so school management committees were always you know required to be uh, there as part of uh, the rte but uh, you know like in most parts of india they were practically defunct elections wouldn't happen on time and parents therefore and civil society would not uh, have a say in how the government schools are run but delhi government has consistently ensured that proper elections are held and these are active bodies with powers and with budgets who can actually hold the school administrations accountable and i would say a lot of the work that we see today in delhi government schools is because the school management committee is actually you know we we breathe we put life into those uh, ideas which you know otherwise exist and therefore i would say that as a as a state uh, there is i mean unfortunately civil society will always continue to play an important role but the extent to which it directly participates in the governance depends on the government whether you are going to create these formal opportunities of en- engagement and give them a legitimate role and space in decision making accountable you know ensuring there is checks and balances or do you keep it ad hoc that every time a civil society wants you have to protest or you have to really approach you know write 10 letters make make 15 20 calls and then wait for your voice to be heard so i'll limit my opening remarks to that thank you yeah um jasmin i th- thank you thank you for all those opening remarks uh, just quickly if i can pitch in to say this that i think as i can't speak for the citizens of delhi but i think what we have seen last year and this year with both the movement of the migrant labor and this year with the second wave of covid has taught us that governments in big cities uh, both bombay and delhi especially the way it was plagued this year by by covid um like to take credit for a lot of things that they don't do and if at all as a citizen of delhi and we saw what uh, rolled out uh, during april and may i think a lot of the credit actually goes to the citizens of delhi for having come together i agree that your commission would have played a role but uh, perhaps not a lead role is what i would suggest and i would like to invite uh, yamini to uh, her opening remarks particularly with reference to where uh, jasmine was saying the uh, the opposition and the media and i i believe even other institutions would play an important role between uh, samaj and sarkar um, i think it's important that we have strong institutions as well and uh, would you like to come in on that 
Thank you. Thank you, Gopal. Uh, and thank you, Jasmine, and to the Rohini Nilikani Philanthropies for inviting me to this really important conversation and uh, very apt that we are having this conversation on Independence Day. I think our independence movement, our freedom movement itself, uh, is, a, is a living historical example of how effectively uh, so, so the people uh, shape a nation state. Um, and, and I think that should be at the center and core of what it means to build a resilient society and a strong state. I think, I you know, Jasmine set us off on a very important discussion, uh, which, which I think it, he, he makes an important conceptual, uh, he's pushing us to think, uh, to make an important conceptual distinction a bit, uh, a bit, or rather a conceptual definition of what we mean by strong states. And I would say that it might be worth uh, pushing that further to make a distinction between an authoritarian state and a strong state. I think a lot of the examples that Jasmine was presenting to us are more examples of authoritarian states. I think, I think of strong states as states that have genuine legitimacy in, dem in democratic societies that legitimacy comes from society. So I see strong societies and strong states as having a very deep synergy. You will get the, the structure, states after all are embedded or the institutions of the state are embedded in society. So a strong, robust society builds a strong, robust state, not an authoritarian state that pushes the uh, pushes its own version of 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 law uh, on upon people but a state that is genuinely responsive to the legitimate concerns of citizens who have as part of the core social contract given it the power to take decisions on its behalf i also think it's really important for us to make a, another conceptual distinction uh, which is uh, i think at the heart of what i define as a strong state which is capability of a state the state is people of uh, institutions and individuals that together create the architecture of the state. And it is the capability by which I mean the capacity of the state to genuinely leverage these individuals and their technical capacities to work towards a common purpose and a common good. When the state fails to do so, when institutions fail to do so, when institutions lose their sense of purpose, that is when you have weak states. And by the way, I think authoritarian states can be very weak states too, because at, no matter how much power the state will have, its ability to actually enable uh, all those institutions and individuals that make the architecture of the state to operate along uh, a certain uh, set of goals uh, and objectives may not be effective because the goals and objectives of the institution and the individuals may be distinct from the goals and objectives uh, of the institutions. I think capable, strong states are states where individuals align towards a mission, a goal, an objective, and the institutional architecture of that institution, uh, where powers are placed, uh, how the checks and balances respond to one another, all are collectively aligned towards the pursuit of that mission, towards the pursuit of that goal. That's what makes for a strong state. And that goal will only inevitably defi be defined through the synergies that we build between state and society. Democracy is about the creation of strong states. Democracies are weak when we throw up authoritarian states and when we throw up states with weak organizational capability, states that are not able to ensure that the goals of the state are effectively met. So to my mind, that's the conceptual distinction I make. And when I think of a strong state, I think of a capable state. I think of a state that is genuinely responsive to the needs and priorities of the citizens that it seeks to represent. And a state that is effectively held accountable by citizens, i.e. it responds and citizens have the capability ability to, uh, to, to articulate their voice to that state. And the state isn't captured by vested interests, whether those are interests of capital or interests of, of politics or interests of uh, kinship, ethnicity, religion, and so on. So, and, and I believe very strongly that that is the imagination of our constitution. Um, our constitution sought to build a strong, capable state, but it also sought to do so in the context of um, a fractured society and potentially 
a somewhat less resilient society. And I think our founding fathers anticipated that through the instruments of law and through the instruments of politics, that they would effectively be able to engineer a strong, resilient society. So I think, and I think that's the tension that continues to be played out uh, in India, even as we ce celebrate our 75th, uh, in the context of what is a very fractured democracy and in some ways a remaking of what effectively we are as a society and how therefore we should be represented uh, in our politics and in our state. Um, that's the tension that lies, I think, at the heart of this tension between resilient societies, strong societies, and I would take uh, Jasmine's framing of strong state as authoritarian state, which is also part and parcel of the tensions uh, that we are engaging with. I think that uh, one of the beauties, uh, the, the beauties and challenges of Indian society and the Indian state State, uh, comes from the fact that we were an unusual democracy. Uh, all political science literature that was written back in the 50s and 60s uh, looked at India with a lot of surprise. How was it that a country as fractured as ours managed to cohere around a democratic promise and sustain its democratic promise? Uh, and embedded in that democratic promise was a very robust, organized civil society. Not so much um, an informal civil society uh, in this because of the nature of our fractures. Uh, we don't often come together uh, necessarily uh, in our everyday lives, but we had a very strong organized civil society that was effectively able to prize open spaces to articulate and push democracy in different ways and forms. Uh, some of those achievements came in the form of the 73rd and 74th Amendment to the Constitution that sought to push democracy closer to people, uh, to borrow from sociologist Patrick uh, Heller, sort of expanding the surface area of the state and bringing the state closer to citizens was in some ways a normative goal of the 73rd and 74th Amendment. Uh, the presence of a very robust media uh, the fourth estate that, uh, with the exception of uh, a blip of few years in the late 70s, uh, more or less performed its function of, uh, um, of putting in checks and balances of the courts that also put in similar checks and balances. And in fact, the courts and civil society came together in a very deep alliance through the entire push of creating a rights-based welfare architecture, which also tells you uh, about the effectiveness uh, of and the possibilities of when institutions of the state and institutions of society come together to prize open and push for deeper democracy. I think all of these, the rights, right to information, the right to work, all of these are really important examples of the effectiveness of the synergies of state and society that together create strong states and resilient societies. I think we are now in the current moment uh, at an important impasse. And there are three elements of that impasse that I feel we must interrogate if we genuinely want to create a resilient society, which in turn will build a strong, robust, capable state. First and foremost, I think our uh, markets uh, run the risk of deep capture. Uh, the, and the relationship between capital and uh, politics, uh, or rather or what we call crony capital, uh, is strong, it's embedded. And one of the reasons why the, the idea of free markets doesn't have deep credibility in the Indian discourse, especially when we start, like in the farm laws, pushing for uh, market reforms in the everyday lives of people that affect them in ways which are very different to capital market reforms, is because... Uh, one of the downsides of 1991 is that it threw up a very, very embedded relationship between the state and capital. So that's the first, uh, I think, uh, uh, and, and when capital starts running the state, uh, society doesn't have an effective voice. The second big challenge that we confront is that as a society too, we are still uh, we are deeply fractured and we haven't quite enabled a robust dialogue amongst ourselves. Uh, and I think that that shows up in our politics again and again uh, on what is the collective legitimacy of the state? What is it that we are asking of the state and how do we build that? The 1990s saw a moment of lower caste political mobilization that threw up new forms of democratic politics, particularly in North India. Um, did those necessarily create the opportunities for deepening socioeconomic rights in India? Uh, we see this again uh, uh, all the way into our present. The absence of a collective dialogue within society and between society and 
and state on socioeconomic rights remains a big uh, lacuna uh, with the occasional uprising up of space through organized civil society. But that dialogue needs to continue to happen in India. Uh, and in fact, I think we are losing the spaces for that dialogue to happen because our politics is now pushing us in a more polarized way. The third aspect of this uh, has been the complete, and I think again, the story, the relationship with capital and the relationship with politics plays in, uh, has been uh, almost the attempt at bypassing uh, the, ins the mediating institutions of society that shape the relationship between politics and people. Uh, technology enables a direct relationship between state and individuals, between politicians and individuals. We talk about direct benefit transfers. Twitter allows our politicians to speak directly to people. Uh, the media uh, gets cut out uh, and the, uh, or bought or cut out. Um, but the media plays a very, very important intermediation role. And that role is losing. The courts are also going through their own churnings. Um, so I think the third biggest crisis to building strong societies and building synergies between state and society lie in the weakening and deliberate bypassing of the mediating institutions of society that ought to be the shape of that shape relationships between individuals and the state, between societies and the state. I'll stop there. Thank you, Yamini. In fact, I found those three points very, very interesting. And I wanted to uh, use the middle one, the collective dialogue uh, one, as a springboard to ask uh, Jasmine this. You know, the, the constitution which uh, Yamini was talking about and the ideas that the founding fathers had at the outset, one of those ideas, I think, seems to have been lost in every discourse we have about the constitution, which is about the idea of fraternity. We talk about equality and liberty all the time, but fraternity hardly ever comes into it. Even in the phrasing of uh, this very conversation we are having, it's about between the state and the society, but it's not about among members of society themselves. So civil society, for example, is not a monolith. There are different groups, each of whom believe that they represent civil society. And to have a conversation where we all look out for each other in the absence of, and this is something that I've commented on before, the US has a civil rights act. So you have it enforced by law to ensure that you honor constitutional obligations and tenets vis-a-vis -vis each other. We don't have that in India. Now, in a scenario like that, and in a situation where we have these cleavages in society, which are exploited by our politicians, do you think that whenever we talk about bringing society and state together and having a conversation and having accountability and transparency as far as our institutions are concerned, isn't it equally important for us to ensure that we have people in society on the same plane? We have spent a large amount of time uh, exploiting ideas of caste and religion in this country. And it, in, in recent years, even ideas of region to a large extent. But the important ideals of education and health and employment are lost. They are gone by the wayside. Uh, your, the the Ahmadi Party in Delhi attempts to address at least education and health in a big way. And you have your outcome budgets, which are supposed to try and explain how it is spent, etc. Can you just take us through what your broad ideas are on this? Sure, Gopal. I think there are, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll also don uh, my former civil society hat because I have spent a few years on the other side. And... Uh, I mean, there is a challenge that even on seemingly, uh, you know, when there is a consensus that there are important issues to be addressed, uh, we do see, um, you know, tension among civil society organizations and therefore what eventually gets communicated to the state or the government in terms of, uh, uh, you know, how the civil society would want the outcome, let's say, on a policy matter to be, tends to be confusing. Part of it is natural, but um, I think that's somewhere the, the evolution, the organic evolution of our own civil society. Um, as far as the state is concerned, you, you mentioned about um, outcome budget. Let me very briefly for the uh, audience talk about uh, this uh, initiative of Delhi government. So one of the, I mean, we do uh, price uh, transparency and accountability that, uh, you know, the fact that governments ought to make itself accountable and that needs deliberate effort 
to say that you know i i am transparent so ask me any questions but what is it that the citizens have to ask questions about or how can media really understand what's really happening with your budgetary spending um you know yamini is one of the uh, at the forefront of thinking about these issues uh, in the country but uh, the experience that we you know and it's still a work in progress but three or four years back delhi government uh, completely reformed its outcome budgeting exercise where we tied today we have around 80 percentage of our budgetary spending which is linked to around 2500 indicators uh, very neatly bucketed into output indicators which is what the government ought to do and outcome indicators which is that if the government has done its work how did the people benefit from it so if you built 100 or 500 mohalla clinics did people actually show up and benefit from those services or not and i think it it creates for us as a government also to be able to really understand where are things going wrong or not and hold the administration accountable it was an important tool but more importantly and over time the delhi media as well as the people have started using this as a real asset because this kind of data and information across scheme year on year and in fact quarter on quarter so we we release the status on each of these indicators every quarter uh, has become a powerful tool uh, for uh, the entire society to actually hold uh, you know the government's performance to account um, final point i would like to make is because you touched the idea of fraternity and uh you know i think i fundamentally think that the reason why um uh, states tend to think very different when it comes to really sitting down together let's say with civil society in that spirit of fraternity and and sorting out issues is because we have bucketed them as uh, you know institutions in silos there's very little lateral movement that happens between the two so this appreciation of each other's perspectives is almost i would say at 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 a level artificial now i i will talk about my own journey and example as i've been in the civil society i've been in the private sector before that today when i'm sitting in the government and if a civil society body approaches us there is a natural inclination to hear the voices but the natural in inclination for many people at the top levels of government i'm talking in generality uh you know is to avoid these conversations so if there is somebody who approaches you with a seriously different view than what say the government is taking the idea is okay how not to meet them and how not even get that can of worms open and and i think the more we create opportunities for lateral movement where people who have experienced the the other part of the society can come and of course you know politics is a medium of that but i'm saying maybe beyond politics even maybe in administration there have been attempts in the past not so very encouraging but i think i mean it's good to talk about these as ideas and values but how do we actually bring them into practice is where i think the discussion needs to move to and i feel i mean and you you see that in us you see people you know after uh, you know trump government or let's say the obama government left office many of the people joined back the civil society and businesses once their government is back in power they come again so there are these sort of and that creates bridges and partnerships which otherwise you wouldn't have seen thanks thanks jasmine I, i think it's very important to know about your own journey and uh, i think very often we tend to con con conflate the individual with the kind of ideas they represent so uh, we'll always appreciate jasmine shah the person but the governments and the policies those are left open to criticism and having been from civil society you can understand that um yamini i just wanted to ask you this because i think this is this is the third point that you had touched upon about how uh politicians especially and uh, and those in government are uh, bypassing the traditional institutions which would mediate and reaching out to uh, you know the citizenry and partly social media has played a big role in this now social media itself seems to be uh, to a large extent at least the intermediaries seem to be under the cosh quite a bit you know the twitters and the whatsapps and the facebooks etc etc and by governments uh, uh, around the world are uh, you know Uh, putting them under siege in a way i wanted to ask you in these conversations that government and those in government are expected to have with civil society are there certain bridges which are irrevocable which bridges need to be as robust as possible the media is clearly one of them and the opposition is perhaps another are there other institutions that you think 
act as a bridge rather than governmental institutions which are available of that kind of control which ought to be independent like say the cbi or the rbi or things like that uh, the judiciary is anyway supposed to be independent for the large part but are there other institutions that you think play an important role and today we might be seeing a situation where people in these strong governments think that look we don't need these institutions at all we can just completely ignore them and we are not going to get any flack for it it's not going to make any difference at the hustings yeah i think the challenge is not so much uh uh that there's a challenge of the present uh but i think we need to look back and ask ourselves why as a society we have actually actively failed to build genuinely robust institutions period uh i mean let's take the university uh you know uh, the, the the great gems of india that produced that that continue till today to produce uh, some of the world leaders our iits our iims uh but you know you look around today and uh, most of most of the elite uh, all of us who are talking to each other uh, if any of us have children the thing that we are doing right now is saving our money to spend uh, uh, when they go to college not in india because we have broken the university system but going off somewhere else to study uh, it tells you something and, and the reason why i bring up the university is because a lot of what we've been talking about where do you build the core of a resilient robust society where do you build genuine deliberation and and uh, architecting of new ideas you build them through the university system you build them through these institutions but collectively if you go back all the way in fact my own think tank which uh, when i which i joined in the mid 2000s one of the standing joke was uh this is like a refugee of scholars who would more ideally like to be in the university not me i'm I, i'm not one of them but many of my colleagues are um or were and, and it has a lot to do with the fact that we didn't actually uh, we, we we had allowed for institutions to atrophy because in fact and this is at the heart the, this the challenge of what does it take to build genuinely strong institutions that are capable that work towards a collective mission and towards a collective goal had been reduced to compliances paperwork and bureaucratic and political capture so i think that the the our in a bill the, the one of the big challenges with india is even though we have a very robust civil society that prizes open spaces for democratic de deliberation that has not translated into building strong institutions that are genuinely meant for a uh, deliberation dialogue uh, engagement and responsiveness between state and society another really important example the 73rd and 74th amendment genuinely meant to create deliberative dialogue democratic spaces at the grassroots where so many of the things that jasmine is talking about monitoring of outcome budgets strengthening the school management committee the day to day interaction between the citizen and the state takes place at a very granular level it doesn't take place necessarily certainly through creation of laws or policies that is where the experts people like you uh come in as, as as the voices and the mediators it's in the everyday is the teacher showing up in my school has the roof been properly fixed uh, is there a doctor in the health care center i've not got my ration card my aadhar card where do i go to articulate my grievance uh, i want to fight against my not being put into the scc uh, list where do i go uh, these are the everyday relationships that citizens that people that citizens forge with the state those are the relationships that need to be built on the back of rights not on the back of uh, that's where genuine citizenship uh, is expressed and articulated and those are the institutions that every arm of government has done everything to undermine um you know the state governments uh, i'm a great advocate for deeper federalism and a great advocate for uh, state rights uh, but i have to say i often find it very difficult to push the state argument because if i start looking at state finance commissions they are pretty broken and they're doing everything within their power not to decentralize and devolve powers to municipalities and to local governments every level of government in india loves decentralization raja chalaya said but only up to their level that's the challenge we don't actually build institutions that enable genuine deliberation and therefore uh citizen voices get articulated through, uh, through mediating 
organized civil society, people like you and me sometimes who don't necessarily represent all voices, politics often finds it easy then to give up to us rather than to enable a genuine compromise between citizens and state. And now politicians have discovered the beauty of actually getting rid of all the intermediary mediating institutions because I can directly speak to the people and I can use tools of technology to also directly deliver to people, uh, which means that there's less need to hold press conferences. There's less need to fight for free press. Um, um, and there's uh, there's also less need to create genuine spaces for uh, deliberation and dialogue because now we don't uh, we've, we've made it difficult for dissenting voices to articulate their views. Uh, and I think that's one of the critical challenges. A robust democracy requires robust spaces of deliberation. These need to be built from the bottom up. The SMC's adjustment was talking about are a very important example of an effort to do so. But it but how that speaks to the municipal government remains a question. Uh, and it, you know. Delhi has a particularly unique architecture, but you look across the country, we have undermined every single local government, even in COVID. Uh, Kerala managed to do relatively better because local governments are stronger, uh, but many other states don't have that infrastructure. That's a living example of why you need strong local governments. I, I think the, the Kerala uh, uh, reference brings to us the question of education again. You were responsible for setting up the accountability initiative dealing with education at CPR. And we have with us uh, Jasmine, who is uh, overseeing the outcome budgets, particularly with reference to education as well, um, at the Dialogue Commission. I was wondering, Yamini, could you just tell us, because I, I, I think there would be an overlap here. I'm just curious, what, what is your experience been at CPR about the difference that, if there is any, and I'm presuming there is, that the uh, that the Delhi dispensation of the app has brought in with reference to outcomes as far as education is concerned. Could you share that experience? Maybe we can start there. Sure. In fact, we've just finished the putting the last touches on a research report that we've written uh, based on the experience of schools in Delhi. We, we, the uh, colleagues and I spent about three years doing an ethnographic study of the, the shifts that were taking place. I, I think, you know, without getting into uh, uh, getting into all of those details, I think one of the really important things uh, that's worth talking about here. Um, we often lament that uh, the biggest challenge of, or, or rather the biggest puzzle of Indian democracy is why a democracy has chosen not to prioritize health and education, which are the two most central uh, aspects of what impacts the capabilities of, of citizens to participate in markets effectively uh, and to be able to genuinely build their capabilities to do so. Uh, I think, uh, and, and uh, you know, dreams have been written over about this puzzle. Occasionally, some politicians have attempted to do a few things. Those things have been limited to at most doing the visible things. So build the infrastructure, build the, uh, the over, uh, uh, you know, put in all the inputs, hire the teachers to a degree, ensure that there's some, some action happening and then learning will happen on its own. I think what was genuinely different about uh, the effort that the government of Delhi has done was that it was willing to say that students enter our schools and even in standard six, they can re barely read, period. Uh, and it has tried to push a dialogue with teachers uh, to get teachers to start trying to think about the classroom, not as a place where you have to complete the syllabus and maximize the uh, top three rows of the classroom that are closer to the curriculum to pass the exam, because that as a society and as a government is what we care about, but to actually start interrogating their pedagogy and ask themselves why students can go through years of schooling uh, and are still unable to answer uh, and are still unable to uh, pick up the basics. It's not a quick exercise. It's not an easy exercise. It's not going to give you genuine results. It's not going to give you quick results immediately. But this is what deep reform means. Deep reform requires deliberation and a shift in how our organizations think of themselves. And interestingly also, uh, the one thing that uh, is, is important is that actually regardless of the quick or non-quick, and there are many failures in, 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 in all reforms, what Delhi government has been trying in schools has had some success, not full success. Uh, but the, uh, that this becomes 
core to the political legitimacy of a political party and i think that's the lesson that our politics needs to learn that uh, politics doesn't always have to mirror society politics can also sometimes seek to create genuine legitimacy for its actions by demonstrating possibility and that legitimacy then creates the consensus between state and society for genuine change beyond education i think this is one of the biggest challenges that we face in india when we talk about religion in politics uh very often political parties now are shying away from uh using certain vocabulary that uh sort of represents uh, ideas that are uh, of of tolerance of pluralism of of secularism that 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 have now been delegitimized uh and uh, parties tend to worry about what happens to the hindu vote uh, across all opposition parties why do we not have a robust response to the ideological challenges we confront today and i think it's because we have to remember that politics also has to articulate a set of values a set of norms a set of leg- uh, and and build legitimacy around ideas rather than responding to the immediate uh, voter uh, 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 sort of you know what the voter survey tells you about voter preferences politics has to lead the way i think in education the government of delhi certainly has shown that it can and it does and it does over time yield genuinely good results on the ground thanks yami i think uh, we'd be looking forward to that report whenever you put it out um uh, i we have some questions from people in the audience i'd like to put one out which uh, comes from kriti shukla She says uh, Arvind Subramanian made a strong point on how India followed a different model and got to democracy before it got to development. This is visible in how our politics and public institutions work. Uh, what is the panel's view on this? Uh, we have examples of uh, countries like Botswana and Singapore, which uh, possibly decided to take a, a bludgeon to try and clean the place up and get to development before opening it up and democratizing. Do you think we we lost a chance there? Uh, go oh, go 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 I'll take it up. No, so I I think I think I I I mean there is evidence there is there are theories and political science devoted to this subject. But uh, I am a big believer in what Amartya Sen had said that countries become fit through democracy and not for democracy. And um, um, you know there are obviously uh, models available. Um, you know, I mean. authoritarian states who have delivered development but at what cost to civil liberties and at you know other uh, rights of marginalized groups and many other things that are um, constituent assembly debated heavily about uh, is all out there um, i do genuinely believe that the example of india and the early stages of sort of navigating the tension whether we would continue to stay a democracy or not we've passed that stage much much long back and that that stands out as i would say a north pole for many emerging democracies i think the challenge now for us is to 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 reach for the next bar which is that yes we can sustain as a vibrant democracy right where there are multiple levels there's a federal structure there are pillars of the state but um resilient society and that's what the topic is uh, that eventually we need to also be able to get through the the, the deep developmental inequality that exists in the state because you know again the constitution talks about equality of all kinds it's not just you know the rights um, and therefore the disparities that we see in education you know if you're born in a rich family or a poor family you get very different outcomes in education healthcare um, you know average wages that we have and the inequality then and i think those inequalities are actually increasing over time and like yamini said you know politics i mean there's been a lot of debate as to when will education health and these kind of development issues come to the center of politics because unless that happened happens you are not going to see a, a mark shift and it took an aam aadmi party and a delhi government to say that as a tenet of our belief we are going to allocate 25% of our budget to education where the average across the country is 10 to 12% and it it was it was as i said a, a tenet of belief and we've stuck on to that and 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 we we talk about it proudly uh, even when we ask for the votes of people that vote for us if you think we have worked in education health and matters that matter to the daily lives of citizens i unfortunately i don't see those at the center of election speeches you know election related conversations in other parts of the state and i think uh, that's 
the open question as to how quickly do we see this kind of uh, uh, politics uh, gain currency in other parts of India. Yamini? I, I actually, Jasmine said most of what I wanted to say. I think uh, one, uh, it's not an either or. It's about what kind of society you want to build and uh, what kind, what is your, what are the values, norms, and and what is your definition of progress? I think that India's great strength lies in her democracy and in the fact that we are a genuinely diverse country that comes together uh, as a nation state and we should be fighting to preserve that not arguing whether that is the reason why we are not uh, economically uh, doing as fast as we are doing as well i think that we must also remember that some of the most politically chaotic years uh, for india were the years where our GDP, gdp numbers looked strongest so <laughs> that should be a lesson in why democracy is important to economic development now, uh, the Prime Minister in, in his speech this morning apparently again mentioned this phrase, Atmanirbar. It's something that I find strange and odd. Um, I, I have looked up a dictionary and it tells me that it means uh, self-reliance. Um, at a time of COVID, I would not expect the leader of the nation to be telling us to be self-reliant, especially when uh, health and its facilities are largely in uh, public, uh, in government hands, and the private sector is way too expensive and uh, difficult to afford. I wanted to know what your views are on a concept like Atmanirbar and when, if at all, uh, it could be called upon on society to exercise it. Because if we are a welfare state and we have reached a level of perfection with our institutions and our level of access to it, then I can perhaps understand that you say, look, everything is in place, you handle it. But when things are in a deplorable uh, state, how does one call upon, uh, you know, citizenry to actually participate in that manner? Uh, Yamni? You know, the, the Atmanirbhar sort of seems to represent many things at the same time. I'm not quite clear what, uh, what exactly, you know, it's sort of been articulated also as an economic policy where, where we're looking much more protectionist. It's being articulated in different ways, I think. Uh, but, but to the larger point, what is resilience? Uh, I think resilience is a society where uh, which is strong, uh, which it has uh, where the state has legitimacy, where the state is responsive to the needs of citizens and the state is genuinely inclusive. And societies are resilient when all citizens have equal opportunity. That's, that's where that's the path that we need to move towards. Uh, one where the state responds and creates an enabling environment for all citizens to have equal opportunity. Jasmine, we have a hard stop at 12. So if I could just leave you with concluding remarks. All right. Um, very quickly, um, I've always been confused about Atmanirbar as well, Gopal. Um, I mean, I, I genuinely believe that the fundamental concern of the state should be welfare of its people. Uh, not it, not hold itself to ideologies which may actually be detrimental, right? And and we have seen, you know, in the economic journey of our nation, as to how finally when we opened up, how people did started enjoying a better quality of life. So, uh, so long as uh, that is what is being prioritized, which I don't see happening. I mean, beyond the rhetoric, there's very little to show what is it that people are going to get genuinely a better deal out of. Um, these slogans but uh no i i mean final comments i mean uh, uh, you know very very interesting uh, discussion and uh, i mean i again uh, believe that for a resilient society yes our constitution and the way democracies function states do have an anchor role um you know we talk about a strong state versus an authoritarian state i agree with that distinction but a state really does need to play that anchor role, play that role of a facilitator if we really are going to bring in the synergies of what a civil society, private sector and average citizens can contribute to governance. And unless and until this idea that I want to hold power and I want to therefore use power to sort of, uh, you know, uh, really do what I wish to do rather than come to a consensus about what are the best ideas and therefore track, monitor, and then implement them. Uh, I think that's the kind of opposing uh, models that we are seeing today. And, um, you know, we'll see.
how it comes, uh, you know, goes by in the years to come. I want to thank both uh, Jasmine and Yamini so much uh, for having participated and shared their thoughts. And to the Rohini Nilikani Philanthropies for having held this session. And uh, thank you for inviting me as a moderator. I was uh, trying to ensure that I don't say Jamini and Yasmin throughout. But thank you very, very much for having us together at this session. Thanks a lot. Thank you for being here. On to the next session. Uh, being the founders, philanthropies, active audience, please.